Well, what a wonderful morning we've had already with the music and the meditation and the opening prayer. Thank you, Aaron and, and Larry and Nancy. A beautiful morning we've already had. And so we begin today's lesson with a story, a story of a conversation between a Buddhist master and their disciple. So the, the master says, there are three stages of one's spiritual development, the carnal, the spiritual, and the divine. Well, what is the carnal stage? Asks the eager disciple. Well, that's the stage when trees are tr seen as trees and mountains are seen as mountains. Well, what's the spiritual? Well, that's when one looks more deeply into things. The trees are no longer trees and the mountains are no longer mountains. And the divine? Ah, that's enlightenment, said the master with a chuckle. When trees become trees again and mountains, mountains. Now the morsel or the lesson in, in this story from the Buddha is how wonderful, how wonderful, all things are perfect, exactly as they are. Well, today's lesson is called Ain't No Mountain High Enough. And our focus is on mountains and the various ways we hold them. Now we're fortunate in the US, we have many beautiful, impressive and unique mountain ranges for our enjoyment. We have rolling hills, and we have high peaks. We even have mountains here in, in Arkansas. And depending on where we are, we can gaze upon them. We might climb them or ski down them or hike, whatever is our desire. And across the world are magnificent mountain varieties of every type. And mountain climbers use a term they call summit when they've indicated they've accomplished reaching the peak of a mountain. Now, my husband, Denny, and the middle daughter of our clan, Tara, summited Mount Kilimanjaro in Tanzania several summers ago. Quite an accomplishment. Some of you may be mountaineers. Mountains are majestic. They reach to the sky in their grandeur, and they inspire awe. awe. They truly show us the beauty of nature, the magnificence of our world. Mountains are referenced in the Bible often. In the Old Testament, or what's known as the Hebrew scriptures, there are many stories about mountains. You know, we have Moses going to the mountaintop. And there's also a few references to being banished to the mountains, which make them sound dark and sinister. Now, in the New Testament, in the Christian scriptures, are many references of Jesus spending time in the mountains and speaking with groups of people on the mountain sides. Now, metaphysically, as taught by Charles Fillmore in The Revealing Word, mountains represent the higher states of consciousness, a higher perspective, an exalted state of mind, a state of spiritual realization where transformation takes place. And unity views scripture from this metaphysical aspect. And there's another way to look at mountains, and one that's commonly used in our language today. And that is when a mountain represents an obstacle, something in our way, blocking our path, a barrier of some sort, a problem, a door that got shut, a relationship that ended, a health challenge, a conflict. Mountains come and go. They change shapes, they change faces and names. A friend of mine is known for saying, same package, different bow. All are part of our human experience, which shapes and defines humanness. They challenge our strength, our courage, our resourcefulness, and our determination. More so, they challenge our sense of the I am, our sense of our divine nature. Now, Jesus was the master of the I am. So when we turn to scripture, we find two very well-known scripture verses that refer to a mountain as just a thing, a large thing. And both of these references of this large thing are found in the, the Gospel of Matthew. Jesus is giving an example of a comparison 
to illustrate the power of faith. So we'll look today at the Gospel of Matthew, the 17th chapter of the 20th verse. Now, the disciples had attempted to heal a child of disease, and they were not successful. And Jesus was able to heal the boy. So the disciples are questioning, why is this so? And Jesus replies to them, for truly, I say to you, if you have faith like the grain of a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible. So the message here is that something in my life is a barrier or a problem, and all I need is faith. Faith in what? Faith in God, faith in the love of God, faith in the presence of God, faith in your inner being, your Christ consciousness. So let's pause here for a moment. For whenever we're reading scripture, the activity itself often places us back in the time in our life when we were first introduced to that piece of scripture. For many of us, that may have been as a child in Sunday school, memorizing verses. You may recall, if you were fortunate enough to hear Nancy Mishka's wonderful talk about the mustard seed a few weeks ago, if you haven't heard it, look at the website and take a look. It's a great talk. She referenced being introduced to this piece of scripture as a child. And children take things literally. And since Nancy felt as a child that she could not move a mountain from here to there, she made the decision that she didn't have enough faith. It was discouraging to her as a child. Well, this piece of scripture can have that effect before we know to read it metaphorically or metaphysically. So are we now listening to it again as a child from the previous perspective? What's the concept of God that we need to have faith in? Is it the God nature we've come to know and we are coming to know? Or is it the God of our childhood, which for most of us was a God out here, a God in the distance, in the clouds? When we've learned individually, personally for ourselves of the Christ consciousness that is everywhere present, most importantly for us to remember it's present within ourselves. For if it is the far off, out God, the one that's far away from us that we're supposed to have faith in, that makes the mountain out of our control. God will fix it or not. God will remove it or not. And we will wait upon God to do the work. Or if our faith is in the I am, in the divine nature within ourselves, faith that we have within us, the wisdom and the power and the innate knowledge the creativity to do all things, to make the impossible possible, then this is what we do. These are the actions we take to move that mountain. For Jesus told us, for even greater things than these shall ye do. The mountain is not out of our ability to move it at all, for we are the only ones who can move it. Nothing is impossible for us for me, for you, Christ as me, the I am can do these things, make the impossible possible. Breathe that in for a moment. The Christ in me, the I am can make the impossible possible. Now the intellect can dance around that one, maybe even hesitantly, gingerly take it on. And the heart the heart loves how that sounds. It's empowering, it's enveloping, it's inclusive. Being that space of the Christ love, not just copying it, being it. And then there are the other parts of ourselves, the other parts of you and me, the parts that say, well, I'm not that powerful. And I'm not really sure about this whole God within thing. That might just be blasphemy. Maybe you're that, that powerful, but not me. Someday, maybe, if I'm very, very good, I will have the ability to do great things, but not now, not today, not yet. 
Well, these are old tapes. They are worn out. They are outdated. And they are not MP3s or 4s. They're not DVDs, CDs, cassettes, or even eight tracks. These are messages carved in stone by our ancestors and weathered by wind and rain. That's how deeply rooted these messages are. Now we've read books, we've gone to lectures and workshops, we've come to church, we've listened to speakers, we've spent time in prayer, we've journaled, we've sat this way, held our hands that way, we've repeated affirmations, we've done our work, and we continue to do our work. And these old beliefs have much less power than they once had. They are less prominent than they once were, yet they remain somewhere just below the surface. For we all have mountains in our lives, some large, some small, some in between. We all have them. So what do we do with them? What placement do we give them? How do we see them? How do we hold them? Do we gaze upon them with agony? Do we dwell upon that mountain? I can't speak for you, but I know how I have held mountains. That was just not fair. If only they would get their act together, that company, that employer, my boss, my friend, my children, my relatives, just fill in the blank. I don't know how. I'm too old. I'm too young. I don't have the time. I don't have the money. If only I had planned better. Mickey Mantle is known for saying, if I knew I was going to live this long, I would have taken better care of myself. And then there are the unrecognized mountains. I'm afraid. I'm afraid I might fail. I'm afraid I might succeed. The human condition happens. Life happens. Death, loss, grief of all kinds happen. Zig Ziglar said, what happens to you doesn't make you what you are. What you do with it makes it who you are. The key is where we place our vision, our attention, because we can look at that mountain, the obstacle, the issue, and there can be a degree of satisfaction in that. It might even be necessary. We can tell all our friends and our family about that mountain. We can point to it. We can get mad. We can stomp and spit about the mountain. And that can be good too. It's part of the process. As long as we don't get stuck there. We can even worship the mountain in a sense. Whew. I would have actually had to challenge my creativity if I'd gotten that job, but I didn't. So what a relief. We can mourn it. We can carry a sadness with it. And again, that's okay if it's temporary. We can get together with our friends to talk about the mountain. We can even create associations or groups that focus on this particular mountain in our life. We can do all these things with the understanding that the longer we look at the mountain and give our attention to it, even negative attention, the larger that mountain looms, the more powerful it becomes in our mind and in our lives. With our attention focused on the obstacle, the problem in our life, whatever it might be, our innate creativity, our creative mind is frozen. It's in neutral. It's inaccessible to us to even imagine our way out or around the problem. We can't think straight. Our beautiful gift of imagination is out of reach temporarily. But when we turn our gaze away from the mountain, the moment we turn our gaze away and look within us, within you, the mountain immediately begins to diminish in size. And when we continue to allow the feelings which have floated to the surface to arise, not stuff them or deny them or mask them, we can work to heal the parts of ourselves that feel unworthy, not good enough, less than. We can move closer to the realization of the I am, the one who moves mountains. Yes, you and me. It's actually the presence of the mountains. They bring to the surface those places, those old beliefs, those negative thoughts within us, which allow them to be recognized and healed. Well, that sounds really good. 
but how do we do it? How do we look within, find the strength, the guidance, and release the creativity from within? Well, as good Unity students, we know that it all hinges on thought. It's an inside job. We create our experience of our world by what and how we think. So how do we alter those thought patterns? What, what books do we buy? What music do we listen to? Where do we need to go? Who do we need to follow? These things may help. I will not discount them. And yet, you already have all the tools you need to strengthen yourself inwardly. Now, it's a secret, but I'll tell you the secret. Are you ready? Spending time in the silence. Spending time in the silence consistently and intentionally. Already, some of our egos have jumped into place. Oh, no, not that. I'm very busy, you know. Well, Unity's foundation is prayer. And part of that foundation is centering prayer, which is time intentionally spent in the silence. And you'll find a, a, a leaflet, a paper on centering prayer when you leave today to take with you. It is in the silence that we are open to the messages of spirit. We have to quiet our mind and open our heart. It's in the silence that that creativity is unleashed, that we are open to the movement of spirit. And through these experiences, we grow stronger in our faith, in our true nature, in our grounded, divine presence. Rumi said, when I am silent, I fall into that place where everything is music. For silence is the language of God, all else is poor translation. There is so much waiting for us in the silence, so much strength, so much confidence in our inner knowing to be embraced, to be loved, to be realized. And as we practice the presence in this way, we develop the muscle of knowing who we are. We develop the muscle, the recognition that we have the wisdom within us. And as we do this consistently, that muscle grows stronger. We have more faith in our inner wisdom, in our divine love. And it comes to us more naturally and more consistently. Everything we do as we move forward from the experience of being in the silence is more heartfelt. It's more authentic. Our beautiful gift of imagination is ignited Creative thoughts multiply and reveal themselves to us. One of my professors when I went to seminary was Reverend Michael Madej, who has since made his trans transition. And he taught a class called Prayer for Unity Leaders. And he said that silence must be experienced daily to know unity, to know true nature. Otherwise, you are on the road to unity. He's speaking of unity in the sense of universal connection, of oneness, of unity of spirit. He also said, time in the silence grows faith and grows answered prayer. For we need time in the silence to make sense of our world. It's beyond time and space, and it opens the way to be in touch with our true essence and to unleash the wisdom, the creativity, the imagination, the strength that we have within us. Both Charles and Myrtle Fillmore, founders of the Unity Movement, set aside time dedicated to being in the silence. Myrtle spent literally hours in the silence, speaking to different parts of her body, giving time, allowing the space for healing to occur. She said, every day, during your period of communion with the Father in the silence, pray for wisdom and guidance, and then make yourself open and receptive to the leading of spirit. So you're in that space of the silence, you're asking for guidance, you're asking for wisdom, and when you recognize that that way has been opened, then you take the action to move forward in that guidance, being receptive to the guidance you're being given. It will be revealed to you just what the next steps you need to take to establish divine order in your life, to move those mountains. 
I invite you to make time for the silence. I encourage you to make a commitment to yourself today. If it's not already part of your practice, perhaps begin this week setting a time to spend oh, 15 or 20 minutes in the silence, then move to doing it twice a week until you're giving yourself this gift of 15 or 20 minutes in the silence every day. Myrtle says every day. And every time you touch your divine nature, you awaken the realization of who you truly are. Fear becomes less and less. You chip away at those messages that are carved in stone. And peace becomes a greater part of your life. And so we celebrate mountains, grand and majestic, rocky, uninviting. For without them, we would not be reminded as to who we are and have the opportunity to reveal our divine nature anew. For there is truly no mountain high enough to prevent your I am, your divine nature, from coming into being. I bless you on your journey, and I'm happy and honored that we are traveling some of these sacred roads together, and we are moving mountains. You are moving mountains, and for this we say, amen. <laughs>